welcome to On The Record, I'm Kylie Merritt. Later in the program, we'll be meeting a group of people working away from the limelight in finding real solutions to Aboriginal unemployment. It's a great story, so keep watching for that one. First, though, to an issue which has been bubbling away this week in the financial press and the opinion pages. Political parties, unions and the financial services lobby have been at each other's throats over the issue of tax breaks on superannuation contributions. Broadly speaking, the Greens and the unions say higher income earners are being treated favourably at the expense of their lower income peers. Now, The finance lobby says removing concessions will simply take away the incentive to contribute more to superannuation and make people more reliant on government support in retirement. So who's right and who's wrong, or is it that black and white? We thought we'd try and take the politics and persuasions out of the argument and look at the numbers. Dr David Knox is a senior partner at Mercer, a superannuation consulting business, and has been crunching the numbers, and he joins me now from Melbourne. Dr Knox, thank you very much for your time. Let's, uh, if we can, just start by sort of recapping where we are on this issue. We've had changes announced at the last two budgets. Could you just explain the situation currently and, and what it will actually be from the 1st of July? In terms of the tax concessions at the moment for superannuation, for, um, the government's wanting to reduce the tax for low-income earners. But for most people, uh, middle and high-income earners, there is a 15% tax on contributions going in from employers. There is then a tax on the investment income in the super funds and when you withdraw your money from super after age 60 there is no tax. But I think the really important issue to make here is that our retirement income system comprises both superannuation and the age pension. The government supports superannuation through taxation support as you've indicated but the government also provides the age pension through the taxes uh, we pay. So if we reduce super in the future, what that means is the age pension costs are going to go up. So it's a balancing act between the two, and we need to recognise that the government supports both superannuation and the age pension. A reduction in superannuation will mean inevitably in the future that more age pensions will have to be paid. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's really the crux of the issue that I want to talk to you about because, you know, you have actually done all the numbers, crunched all the different scenarios and, and sort of shows how, how we come to those numbers. But I just want to first of all kind of go over the, the various arguments before we actually get to just the numbers. Uh, the sure. Greens and the unions have been arguing this week that the flat structure of the tax, a 15% tax on contributions, is unfair. How, I mean, I think what they're saying is that they'd prefer to see the contributions tax uh, implemented in some other way, that it would be somehow scaled. Sure. Now, you're absolutely right. The tax on employer contributions uh, is a flat 15%. And that does appear unfair on the surface. And if you just look at the tax concessions on super, yes, it appears unfair. But I think the point to uh, make is that's only half the story because the numbers we've shown is as we increase super as more money goes into super then in fact in the future people will have more superannuation income in their retirement and therefore they'll be relying less on the age pension. What we've actually shown is when you look at both the super tax concessions and the age pension received by individuals at different income levels it's remarkably flat. Put the point very simply, low income earners will receive the age pension, high income earners will receive very little age pension but live on their super. And the middle Australia, which is most Australians, what we're trying to say for the future of the economy in the country as we have an ageing population is we need to save now so that we've got money for retirement and we're not relying on the age pension in future years. So there is a trade off. The concentration on super tax concessions is only half the story. Yeah. Okay, let's look at this trade-off then. Um, the modelling that you've done looks at a range of scenarios from singles and couples, uh, and you, you've used uh, starting salaries of $40,000 a year and $62,500 a year, and you've then looked at various salary increases and levels of contributions. Uh, we can't fit them all onto the screen, but I've taken one example just sort of to give viewers an idea of what you're talking about. So if we look at, at this scenario, this is a comparison comparison of a couple, both with starting salaries of $40,000 uh, a year and contributing 9% to super. Now your assumption is based uh, on the female working 25 years in two chunks while the male works for 40 years. What you've then done is taken the present value of estimated government super concessions for both 
as well as the present value estimated of pensions for both. Uh, and it's pretty clear that the couple uh, which sees salary growth at a higher rate, so this couple, their salary growth is growing at 4% uh, per annum and the second couple uh, is, is growing at around 8% per annum. So the, the second couple uh, is obviously contributing more to super and getting more uh, concessions from the government. So you can see there. Uh, their concessions are nearly $100,000 more. Um, but then you look at the pension and, and it's, it's all reversed and it actually ends Correct. up costing the government around $31,000 less in present dollar value terms. Uh, now, Dr Knox, I mean, that, that's, you know, as I said, that's one example. And the interesting thing about the work that you've done is that you have looked, you know, right across the spectrum of people earning, you know, starting their, their, their career on $40,000 and, you know, right up to the spectrum of ending their career on, you know, $200,000. But Correct. does this trend in terms of that balance pretty much work across all of those examples? Absolutely right. It works across for singles and for couples and it works across the vast majority of income or career patterns, if you like. Whether you start at low income, middle income, whether you have a, a low salary increase or a high salary increase, when you allow for both the age pension and the tax concessions, it's remarkably flat. It, it bubbles around a little bit, but broadly speaking, it's flat across all career income levels. Of course, what we're looking at here is not a single year, but a if you like, a 60 or 70 year pattern because you've got 40 years in the workforce, uh, whether that be full time or part time, and 20 or 30 years um, after you retire. Uh, I think the other point I'd make is if someone receives the full age pension, the value of that today is in the order of $350,000 for a single person. Now, you've just got to put that in the context of tax concessions. If we can reduce the cost of the age pension going forward, and I'm not suggesting we abolish it, but just reduce how many people we pay it to uh, because people have superannuation, uh, then in fact we're reducing the burden on the future government budgets of our ageing population. Uh, you, you did mention that it bubbled around a bit. Uh, in all of your modelling, you do pretty much see a downward trend as people earn more and contribute more, except for uh, one of the cases which we get to sort of the higher income earners. This is a, a couple, uh, a threshold who are growing, that they start on 62.5k a year and they grow their salary at around 12% a year, um, at which point the level of government support for retirement income jumps right back up again. Um, is this an anomaly in the various cut-off points or do very high income earners drain more on the public purse in terms of concessions? Um, I, I think what that extreme uh, example you, you, you suggested shows is that the individual who let's say, comes out of university and might be a, a medical or law graduate and has very, very high salary increases for their first 10 or 15 years, um, they do receive uh, tax concessions that are, are, are quite high. And in fact, it's not the contributions that is, uh, is the concession, um, it's the investment income um, in the super. But that is a, we put that in to present the full spectrum. That is a very small proportion of the total population. Uh, very few people... Uh, are earning you know, $200,000 a year at the age of 30. Um, and that's what that example uh, looks at. So it's, uh, it, it's not, not indicative of all high income earners. Um, many high income earners don't receive high income earning, um, high incomes until the age of 40 or indeed 50. Um, and the example you, you suggested was, was a very small proportion of the, uh, if you like, even all high income earners. Okay. Now, the government itself uh, has said this week in, in response to all the chatter that's been going on uh, about this is that the system seems to be about right as it is. Would you agree, because we've got different, various lobby groups saying that it does need to be you know, tinkered with or fundamentally changed, do you, do you think that we're, we're about right at, at the status quo? Sure, let me make a couple of comments. The first thing I'd say is that the government's plan to uh, introduce a uh, contribution tax offset, if you like, for low income earners, uh, those earning below $37,000, which are many part time earners, uh, that's a really good move, uh, and I deplore that. I think that does improve the equity of the system. Uh, the other thing that uh, improves the equity of the system is the contribution caps. Uh, that obviously prevents high income earners from putting too much into super. Uh, that cap is coming down to $25,000, um, which is an indexed figure that will increase over, gradually increase over time with indexation. Uh, the point I'd make there, though, is that that cap uh, really hurts many people in their 
shall we say, late 40s, 50s and indeed 60s who have the opportunity to catch up in super. Um, often in your 50s, uh, children may have left home, the mortgage may be paid off. You have the capacity to save a little bit extra, um, but the cap actually hurts those people in their 50s. So uh, these people in their 50s haven't had superannuation um, all their career, many of them. Uh, we only reached 9% uh, superannuation contributions 10 years ago. So many of these individuals have relatively small superannuation balances. And I think there is a need to look at the over 50s and increase that cap uh, for that age group to give them the opportunity to catch up. Um, I, I think that's certainly what the financial services lobby is, is asking for. This uh, debate's kind of reminded me of, of the fight that we often hear over government funding of non-government schools. You've got the public school lobbyist saying that private schools shouldn't get funding while the private schools say the funding they receive helps them offset costs and allows them to offer more places and then you know takes pressure off the public system. A lot of it seems to come down to your belief systems though as opposed to the actual numbers. What do the actual numbers tell us about how well placed Australia is to fund its ageing population either through self-funded retirement or through pensions? Okay one of the pieces of research that uh we conduct is the Melbourne Mercer Global Pension Index which compares the Australian system with systems around the world. Uh, last year we produced a report that compared the Australian retirement income system to 16 countries. Australia in fact ranked second uh, in that report of the 16 countries behind the Netherlands. So as a whole we're pretty well placed. Why are we well placed? I'd say two reasons. Uh, one, we have a uh, a well-developed superannuation system which is still maturing but has the basics of people putting money aside for the future uh, and therefore not relying on the government. Um, and in terms of the age pension, we have an age pension that with its means testing, with its assets test and income tests, concentrates on those um, who are less fortunate or who are less able to support themselves. So again, the combination of the age pension and superannuation is part of the Australian advantage. David Knox uh, from Mercer will have to leave it there. I thank you very much for your time. It's an interesting topic and uh, I don't think it's going to go away in a hurry. Indeed, it's been a pleasure. <laughs> Good to talk to you. Dr David Knox there from Mercer, a superannuation consultant. After the break, unsung heroes of the jobs market. We'll be back in a moment.